We are reading Deep Water by Wat Key. This is chapter 16 through 25. As the sun climbed higher in the sky, it seemed to focus all of its heat directly on our heads. I felt I'd won a small victory with the skin suit masks, but I knew that nothing we did was a permanent fix. I was starting to believe that none of my defenses really mattered anymore. My exposed skin below the water was soggy white and as dead-looking as cadaver meat. It felt like the sea lice were eating it from my bones. And if my outside environment wasn't enough to finish me off, dehydration was attacking me from the inside, leaving my mouth and throat swollen. The agonizing pain, both mental and physical, was nothing like I'd ever felt or imagined. I got kicked out of school. I heard Shane say. After a moment, I said, What? I got kicked out of school, he repeated. I wasn't sure why he was telling me this, but I didn't cross, or, but it didn't cross my mind to have any sympathy for him. What'd you do? I got caught cheating twice on my final exams. I wasn't surprised. Now I'm going to boarding school, he continued. Well, you can start over then. I guess so, he said. You don't have any friends, do you? Yeah, I have friends, he said defensively. Like who? I challenged. Nobody you know. You don't even live here anymore. How can you have friends when you act like a spoiled brat? You think I act like a spoiled brat? Are you kidding? You argue with your dad over who gets the newest spear gun. There's people who would work all summer to have your old dive equipment. He drives me crazy. Nothing I do is good enough for him. What's that got to do with it? I don't understand why you wouldn't want to be nice to people. Why would you want to be a jerk? I wish you'd stop calling me that. Fine, I said. I'm sorry for calling you names. And I got the coordinates of the Malzahn tanks on my iPhone. I turned and faced him. See, you're a total jerk, Shane. You know how long and hard my dad worked to find those tanks. You know how much he gave up for that. I, he wrecked our family over those things, and you think you can steal it all on his first trip out? Just when he was finally heading in the right direction? You're hopeless. It was, you and your dad both deserve whatever you've got coming, and it really sucks that I've got to go down with you. It was a mistake, he said. Oh, now it is? I'm sure it's all a mistake now. Now that I'm the only one who can save your butt, yep, here I am, the girl who was going to bring up your fish. Shut up and don't talk to me. I didn't have to tell you, he said. I lifted my arm and made a fist and held it before him. Shut up, I warned. The sun was directly overhead, hot and getting hotter, while my body from the neck down was cold and getting colder. None of us were talking, and Mr. Jordan even appeared to be sleeping. Time passed like there was no real system to it at all, like it was something you imagined, something that Mother Nature could slow down and use to torture us. I heard a splashing to my right. I turned to rest my eyes on a sea turtle that must have been five feet across. It flipped its way easily along the surface, not the least bit alarmed by us. Is it dangerous? Shane asked. I didn't answer him. I thought about the turtle and how comfortable it was way out here in this desolate landscape. There was nothing it could do for us, but it made me feel better to finally see something else alive. And the turtle was a connection with land. Perhaps it had even been born on the beach and Gulf Shores. Got any news, Mr. Tuttle? Mr. Turtle, I said. It came slowly past me. So close, I reached out and touched its soft, leathery shell. Then I had a strange thought. Maybe way out here where no one would ever know, it might talk to me. Maybe all of nature's creatures really could communicate with us, but didn't. They let us believe we were so smart and watched us and laughed at us, and only when we were about to die would this big trick be revealed. Talk to us, I said. You're losing it, Shane mumbled. Shut up, Shane. I said. The turtle paddled away and loneliness and misery settled over me again. The thirst was the worst of it all. So bad that I started to think about drowning. 
how it might be the best way to go. Nothing, I decided, could be worse than being thirsty, but a small voice inside me reasoned that if I was facing death, I might as well fight it. There was really nothing to lose. The end result was all the same. According to my dive watch, it was two o'clock in the afternoon when we reached blue water. The wall was so defined that I could float on the green side of it and stick my hand through into the blue. It was enormous and remote and as frightening as something from outer space. The current was going to pull us beyond it no matter what we did. But the wall was no place I wanted to linger. I began swimming until I felt the tug of my companions against the line behind me. Get away from it, I said. The tone of my voice was enough to keep Shane from asking questions. He tugged his father and followed me out of the green and into the blue swells. After a few minutes, I stopped and rested. What'd you see, he said. Nothing, I said. I just didn't like it. What makes the water so different out here? Why the blue? There's more particles in the green. It reflects the light differently. If we had a map, where would this be? Somewhere between Alabama and the Florida Peninsula. It moves. The line moves? Yeah, it moves with the tide and current. Can you stop asking questions? There's got to be fishermen out here, he said, ignoring me. There's got to be somebody, right? I didn't answer him. I'm itching all over. I think those sea lice are in my wetsuit. Are they eating me? I hoped they were. When I didn't respond, Shane turned to me. He watched me, but I didn't look at him. Dad told me to get those coordinates, Julie. It wasn't my idea. I don't care anymore, I said. Stop talking. It's just us now. I don't want to die like this. He had a point. If anything, it was tiresome being angry. Tiresome and senseless in the face of what we were up against. No, I said. They're not eating you. They're driving me crazy. I finally turned to him. I don't understand how your dad being a jerk gives you an excuse to be one, I said. I think I'm mad at him all the time, and it makes me mad at everybody else. The reason I'm never good enough for him is that I just cost him money. I looked at Mr. Jordan. There was no sign he heard us talking about him. Money sucks, I said. So, you know what I mean? In a different way, my parents are messed up over trying to make it. Yours are messed up over trying to spend it. Is that why they got divorced? I don't know, really. Sometimes I think that if Dad was any good at making money, then Mom would have been happier. But now Mom's making a lot of money, and she seems more unhappy than ever. And then you die, and it doesn't mean anything. Nope. And maybe we could have been friends, he said. I shook my head. You really are clueless. What? Us being friends has nothing to do with whether or not either of us has money. You have to care about somebody besides yourself. You're not nice. Well, you're the one who punches people in the face. What's with you in the attitude? I looked at him. What's with you and your stupid long hair? He stared back at me. With the ridiculous mask over your face, I imagined his looking I imagined his look saying, "But you can't even see my hair." And it was all suddenly funny to me. I began to laugh uncontrollably, and a moment later, Shane was laughing with me. You look like something out of a bad homemade horror movie, I said, like an iPhone horror movie. I can be nice, he finally said. Okay, when's the last time you were nice? We took a field trip to a nursing home before school let out. I met this old lady and played bingo with her. What was her name? Well, I don't remember. So she's just old lady? I played bingo with her he said defensively, and I knew her name at the time, but I don't remember it now. I chuckled. Okay, at least you have a little bit of heart. We drifted along without speaking for a few minutes. Then Shane said something else. I cried when my grandfather died. I looked at him. I stayed in my room for a week and wouldn't come out. You must have really liked him. He was the nicest person I ever knew. Dad never got along with him, so we didn't see him much. But sometimes he'd drive down from White Hill in his old pickup and get me, and we'd spend the day together. My grandparents are dead, I said. I wished I'd known them. I called him Papa. 
He didn't have a lot of money, but I never felt better than when I was with him. He loved to fish more than anything, but he always took me to the movies and said, Why? Because he knew it was what I wanted to do, not what he wanted to do, and then we'd go out for some cheap Mexican food and talk about the movies and what we thought of them. Why didn't they get along? Shane looked at his father. I think Dad was ashamed. Of what? Shane turned to me again. Of growing up poor, he said, of having a dad who worked at a service station. Plenty of times I'd, find my, I'd found myself frustrated with my own dad, but I was never ashamed of him. I thought one day I could be a lawyer, Shane said, and then he'd be proud of me. It's not worth it, I said. It's got to be. He's the only friend I've got. I started to make a snide comment about Shane admitting that he really didn't have any friends after all, but something in his voice made me keep quiet. I looked down past my friends at the blue water descending in bent beams into the blackness of unimaginable depths. I thought of how small and whiny our problems seemed in comparison. I felt something brush against my leg. I yelped and jerked it away instinctively. What? Shane asked. Before I ever even lowered my head, I knew underneath me. I saw the sleek gray body gliding below. So they're here to finish us off. My mind raced, remembering everything I'd learned about shark defense. I'd listened to Dad talk about sharks. I'd seen hundreds of them from the Barbie doll. I'd even encountered a few up close on dives, but I've, I'd never had to defend myself against one. The sharks I'd seen underwater were always curious at first, circling and inspecting us. There were mostly black tips, but occasionally we'd see nurse and f bull sharks. Dad would signal to surface immediately and get into the boat before they had a chance to get aggressive. I swam to Shane and grabbed him and Mr. Jordan. We've got to huddle up, I said, facing out. Shane had resisted. What? he asked again. Shark, I said, shoving him, turn around, lock arms with me and your dad. We locked elbows and formed a tight triangle. I had this. I held the spear gun across my chest and felt myself trembling. Mr. Jard Jordan mumbled something that I couldn't understand. Shoot it with the spear gun, Shane said. Be quiet, I said. How many? I only saw one. It bumped me. I'll bet there's more, he said. There's always more. Stop talking, I said. I yanked off the sun mask and stuffed it into a pocket on the front of my BCD. Then I slipped my diving mask on, gathered my courage, and lowered my face into the water. I looked around and saw nothing. Is it gone, Shane said. Tell me it's gone. I didn't answer him. I kept searching. Then I saw it again, a dull gray sliver far below, circling, contemplating us, contemplating a lot of things. Sharks only have two small blind spots, one in front of their snouts and one directly behind their heads. The way their cat-like eyes are positioned on their heads gives them nearly a 360-degree view. Dad said they see the world like a black-and-white IMAX movie, considering everything that moves on the big screen a possible meal. Shane suddenly kicked out and shouted, Crap! I jerked my head around and looked at him. I saw it, he stammered. I almost touched it with my fin. I put my face into the water again and saw another gray sliver directly below us. This shark looked to be nearly eight feet long. It's another one, I told him. Put your mask on and watch them. Kick for the snout or the gills. I can't kick out with my fins, he said. You're right, I said. Take them off, but don't lose them. Stuff yours down my back and I'll stuff mine down yours. He quickly struggled with our fins until we had them free and jammed down where we'd held the spear gun. Mr. Jordan wasn't going to be any help, so we were just going to have to drag him about and look after him and us at the same time. I'm getting my knife out, Shane said. Don't touch your knife, I snapped. If you cut our BCDs, my mistake by mistake, we're dead. We're already dead, he replied. I felt the same way, but I didn't want to admit it. It was all I could do to remain calm. Fear hummed in my ears, and I felt it in my jaw. I wanted to scream against the impulse to draw myself into a ball and give up. 
Don't get out your knife, I said again. Kick them. They're only curious right now. Sometimes they'll leave. Shane didn't agree with me, but he didn't reach for his knife either. He took off his sun mask and put it in his BCD pocket, then got his dive mask over his face, locked arms with me and his dad again, and peered into the water. There was another one now, three sharks circling not twenty feet below us, more than we could keep our eyes on. The largest of them had a scar on its side like something had bitten a chunk out of it. The other two looked like twins. I see three, Shane said. I didn't answer him. I swung the beer spear gun out and held it before me. It wasn't cocked, all, but I reasoned if I could poke them in the face with the sharp point, it would alarm them more than a blunt kick. They looked like bull sharks, but to me all sharks were basically the same, and knowing what kind they were wasn't going to help us. The shark with the scar broke circle and s broke circle and swam out of my vision. Where's that one going? Shane cr said. Crap, where's he going? Look for him, I said. I'll keep watching these other two. Suddenly, Mr. Jordan grunted, and I spun to see Scar gliding away. I let go of Shane and put my face back into the water, looking Mr. Jordan over for any wounds. Did he bite him? Shane shouted. I couldn't see any signs of injury. No, I said. I think he just bumped him. Why do they keep doing that? I locked elbows with them again, trying to find out what we are, I said. What if they come after Dad? I don't know, I don't know, Shane. Do what you can. Scar joined the other two below us for only a moment before breaking away again. You watching him, I said. He's gone, Shane replied. He disappeared. No, I see him. He's on the surface. I looked to my left and saw Scar's dorsal fin slicing through the top of the water. He seemed to be aiming for Mr. Jordan. He's coming at your dad, I said. Get ready. Scar veered away an instant before nosing Mr. Jordan in the stomach. He remained out of reach, all eight feet of him passing slowly before my face. I saw his eyes open up close, staring right at me. Directly below the eye, his mouth gaped in a cruel grin lined with hundreds of knife-edged teeth. The teeth are designed to punch slits so that the shark can pull meat from its prey as easy as tearing a page from a loose-leaf notebook. Mr. Jordan mumbled something again, and then I felt him struggling. I tried to hold on to his arm, but he managed to twist away. Hold your dad, Shane! I've got him! Come on, Mr. Jordan said. I saw that Shane still had a hold of his other arm. But now our protective triangle was open and I was hanging out at one end of it. What's he doing, I said. I don't know. Crap, they're all under us again. How many? Three, all three. I desperately wanted to look down, but I felt more pressed to get back into formation. At the same time, I knew that it was dangerous to splash any more than we had to. I swept my free arm slowly through the water, trying to reach Mr. Jordan again. Keep watching them, I said. Then I saw a glint of steel flash past my wrist. I jerked my arm back and saw Mr. Jordan had his dive knife out, slashing aimlessly through the water with it. I'd narrowly missed getting cut. Come on, he murmured again. He's got his knife out, Shane. What do you want me to do about it? Get it from him. I swung around behind Shane and grabbed hold of his BCD. I watched as he worked his way behind his father and tried reaching over his shoulder for the arm waving the knife. Give it to me, Dad, he said. Mr. Jordan didn't seem to hear him. Give me the knife. Mr. Jordan began to struggle, and Shane put his arm around his neck. Get away from me, Mr. Jordan growled. Shane hugged him close until his chin was over his dad's shoulder. You gotta stop, Dad, Shane cried. You gotta put the knife up. But Mr. Jordan only struggled more. He began lifting his arm from the water, repeated, repeatedly plunging the knife blade down at his imaginary sharks. Get away from me, Mr. Jordan yelled. Stop it, Dad! Let go of him, I shouted. The splashing attracts them. Shane shook his dad and hit at the side of his face. Dad, stop, he cried. Stop! Now both of them were splashing and frantic, and it didn't look like there was any way to reason with Mr. Jordan. And he was only moments from cutting one of us. I jerked at Shane's BCD, trying to pull him off. 
Let's go, Shane. Get away from him. Then I heard a tearing sound and a hiss. Bubbles began to rise around us. I brought up my feet up and kicked against Mr. Jordan's back, trying to pull Shane off him. But it wasn't enough. I smacked Shane's head, trying to get his attention. Let him go! Shane went limp, and it flashed through my mind that maybe he'd been stabbed. Mr. Jordan started to yell something, but then the yell was cut off as his face slipped beneath the water. I suddenly realized I was dangerously tied to two people I could no longer control. I reached to my, I reached to my ankle and drew my knife and cut the line that was holding us together. Then I stretched around Shane and cut the line between him and his dad. After shoving the knife back in the sheath and regaining my hold on Shane's BCD, I pulled my feet up and kicked out at Mr. Jordan again with everything I had. His head slipped through Shane's elbow and we were suddenly free of him. I grabbed Shane and swam us backwards. Grab his line, I said. Shane reached out and grabbed the trailing end of Mr. Jordan's line that I'd cut. Both of us watched his dad flail about with his knife, trying to stay afloat in a deflated BCD. I knew that his weight that his weight still attached it was impossible. He went under, then appeared again, looking at us this time with wide crazed eyes. I can't hold it, Shane cried. Try, I said, grasping him tightly. He's going to kill us all. There's nothing else we can do. I passed one hand quickly over Shane's BCD to make sure it was still inflated. It felt firm. Mr. Jordan gasped and went under again. I watched Shane's arm stretch out and the line slip through his fist. I spun him around to face me. His eyes were red and wide and he was breathing rapidly. I didn't want to put my dive mask back on. I didn't want to see what was going on below us. I only knew we needed to get out of there. I jerked the fins out of my BCD and shoved them at Shane. Put them on, I said. Shane stared at me and didn't move. I held the spear gun to my chest with an elbow and clamped one of his fins in my teeth. I went under and grabbed his leg and lifted it and started cramming his foot into the other one. It seemed impossible with everything I was holding. Then I dropped the spear gun in my struggle and caught a blurry glimpse of it sinking into the depths. Panic, panic flooded me. I resurfaced and got a breath. Help me, I yelled. Shane reached down like he was about to do something, but I didn't have the patience for him. I dove beneath the surface again and managed to get the fin strap around his ankle. Then I grabbed his other foot, shoved on the second fin, and strapped it. I came up, jerking my own fins from his back and crammed them on. To my relief, Shane grabbed hold of me and started kicking. Then we were both kicking with everything we had. The sharks were gone. Mr. Jordan was gone. The blue water carried Shane and me along, our legs hanging limp below us, the sun beating down on our sun masks. After we stopped swimming, I tried, I tied us together again, but nothing I did now seemed of any use. Neither of us had spoken a word since we'd left his dad. Shane seemed too weak, too much in shock to express his feelings over what had happened. Whatever those feelings might be, Mother Nature is going to finish us off. She's only holding on to us a little longer for her amusement. My thirst was torturous, and my skin crawled and burned with the thousands of tiny sea lice stinging me. I imagined by now they'd worked their way inside Shane's wetsuit, too. My body seemed nothing more than a lump of soggy bug-infested meat carrying a brain, and until the bugs got to my brain, I'd have to float like this and feel them eat the rest of me away. The thought of drowning myself always got stuck like a switch inside me that I couldn't flip. It really didn't make sense that killing yourself couldn't be more of an option, especially when you knew with all, certain, with all certainly you were going to die anyway. But I couldn't imagine not seeing Mom and Dad again, and I'd have to take off my wetsuit if I wanted to sink and I didn't want Shane seeing me naked. I suddenly laughed to myself. What? Shane said through trembling teeth. I was thinking that I didn't want you to see me naked. Why is that funny? Because it's so stupid that I would care about something like that now. Why are you even talking about it? I was thinking about drowning. It's going to be hard to drown as long as I have a wetsuit on. I'd have to take it off, and then you'd see me naked. 
Whatever, he said. I'm just cold. I'm so cold and thirsty. The neoprene of Shane's wetsuit was only three millimeters, or mils, thick. I had on a five mil, and the extra thickness was keeping me a little warmer, especially now that we'd stopped swimming. The gulf water was steadily bringing down our core body temperatures. It was probably close to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, but even that'll kill you if you're exposed to it long enough. When the sun set again, we'd get even colder, and eventually both of us were going to become hypothermic. I got behind Shane and unclipped the front of my BCD so that it spread open. Then I stuck my arms up the front of his BCD and hugged him and felt him shaking against me. I had never been so close to a boy. I had always been nervous about if and when, how, and how I would find myself in such a situation. Now, even though I wished our circumstances were different, I felt relief to get beyond it, and it was more natural and comforting than I had expected. Is that better? I said over his shoulder. He nodded. I felt shivers running up his body like electric pulses. We're going to have to try to float like this, I said. Shane stopped shivering, not long after I hugged him to me. I managed to wrap my hands inside the straps of his BCD so I could relax them. Then I rested my chin on his shoulder, and somehow I was finally able to drift off to sleep. I had strange flitting dreams that made no sense. I was at a fancy Cinderella ball, and Shane was in a tuxedo. He looked handsome and held my hand, and I was so and I was proud to be with him. Then I was standing alone on a beach in a storm. Rain was hitting the calm water like loud static on a television, and this strange noise worked at my ears until I woke and opened my eyes. It was late afternoon. The sun was setting cool and orange before me, and the gulf waters appeared as still as a swimming pool. Then I realized the sound of the rain was still playing in my ears. I lifted my chin from Shane's shoulder, not a hundred yards from us in both directions, for what looked like miles. The surface was boiling and popping with small feeding fish. Shane? I said. He didn't answer. Shane? What? he muttered sleepily. You see that? What? The fish? After a moment he said, yes, is that bad? I think it's bluefish or something. They'll probably be scared of us. Good. You still cold? Yes. I know, me too. I think my legs are frozen. They're only stiff. Mine are the same way. Try to bend them. I am, he said. I worked one of my legs in front of his ankle and put the other behind his knee and bent it slowly. Then I felt him begin to move it on his own. That's better, he said. I did the same to his other leg. Maybe we should swim some, I said. My legs are feeling stiff, too. I don't think I can. I'm too cold. Try, I said. I backed away and fastened my BCD again. I pulled off my sun mask and then pulled Shane's off, too, and stuffed them into my BCD pocket. Then I started kicking slowly and pulling Shane with me. After a moment, he was kicking both his legs, and we put our dive masks on our faces and peered down at the endless blue below. The popping and splashing of the feeding fish grew louder until we began to see the outside edges of the bait, suspended like millions of bits of glass that jerked and flashed about in giant glittering clouds as far as we could see into the depths. Bluefish and Jack Crevel raced through, the clouds dispersing, then reforming. Then the feeding frenzy parted and closed in behind us and continued on all sides like we were nothing more than a small blister on the surface of it. And for a moment, I was mesmerized, forgetting about my thirst and the cold water and the sea lice and thinking it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And thinking that if I were to die, and, slow, and slowly sink to the bottom, that it wouldn't be such a bad way to go. When we stopped swimming, there was only a sliver of sun left on the horizon. The wide expanse of feeding fish had broken up and existed only in patches, like isolated rain hitting the water. I unclipped and hugged Shane to me and pressed my cheek to his cold face. In that way, we watched the last sun sinking into the water like a dying coal. The night sky was motionless, but the stars were thick and cast a soft glow over the calm water. 
Below our feet, jellyfish hovered like green and pink nightlights. How can Mother Nature be so beautiful and so mean at the same time, I thought. I told myself that if I ignored thoughts of hypothermia, my shivering would stop. But then, all I could think about was my thirst and the bugs and the possibility of dying. Which brought me back to being cold and miserable again. I think I'm going to die tonight, Shane said. No, you're not, I said. What's the point in this? If we go, we go together. I don't know if I can wait. Don't stop talking to me, I said. I'm so tired of it all, he said. I don't think you should sleep. Do you, sh do you think the sharks ate him? We can talk about anything but that. Why didn't they come after us? I don't know. They lost interest. I don't want to go like that. You won't. He went crazy. You can't let that happen to me, no matter what. It won't happen to you. I'm going to stay with you. He never touched me, you know. I didn't answer. I didn't understand. I mean, he shook my hand sometimes, like I was a grown-up or something, but he never patted me on the back or put his arm around me. I'm sorry, I said. Sometimes I wished he were dead, and I'm wondering now if I got my wish and I'm being punished for it. But you didn't really wish that. I did, Shane said, but it wasn't like I thought it would really happen, you know? It's like a bully at school that you don't want to deal with. Yeah, I said, I get it. Shane was quiet for a few minutes. Shane, I said, what? I'm going to keep talking to you every few minutes to make sure you don't go to sleep. Okay, he said. I think if you go to sleep, you'll die. Okay, he said. Now it seemed there was no difference between me and Shane. He was a boy and I was a girl, but mostly we'd been reduced to two people sim simply staying alive. And right there, at that moment, he was the most important person in the world to me. I couldn't think of anything worse than losing him and being alone. And just the day before, I'd hated him with all my heart. The Jordans had been 30 minutes late for their charter. Dad and I heard them arguing outside the dive shop before they came through the door. Then Shane entered in a huff, his dive bag slung over his shoulder. Use the old one, Mr. Jordan was saying to him. Chill out about it, will you? I liked my new one, Shane snapped. What do you want me to do about it? I want you to put it in my dive bag next time. Mr. Jordan dropped his equipment on the floor beside his sons. Shane looked at Dad and then at me like he realized for the first time we were also in the room. I was sure he recognized me, but he didn't act like it. Mr. Jordan approached Dad. How's, how's the visibility out there? Should be pretty good, Dad said. It was, a, it was good a couple days ago, but you never know until you get in the water. You got any... Thing decent we can dive dad smiled smugly yeah I've got something decent what like that old Lipscomb tug you took me to last year I suppose that's where all the other outfits would take you you're right Gib he said there's three other dive shops I could have gone to today the only reason I'm standing here right now is because they're booked up and unless you've got something to offer me that they don't I doubt I'll be back Dad maintained his sly grin for a moment longer, then said, Well, you came to the right place, Hank. How do a couple of untouched army tanks sound? Three years down, never been fished or dove. Mr. Jordan raised his eyebrows with interest. Where? About thirty miles out. Whose are they? Mine. I put them out there. Mr. Jordan studied him suspiciously. How'd you pull that off? Don't worry about it. Mr. Jordan smiled and slowly and nodded slowly. I see, he said. Your big secret spot. Well, you got my attention, so what's this going to cost me? Two thousand, one dive. I looked at Dad. He'd never charged that much. I looked at Mr. Jordan. He hadn't flinched at the price. He actually appeared to be considering it. What about two dives? Shane interjected. Dad kept his eyes on Mr. Jordan. One dive, Dad said. Then we head in. Mr. Jordan didn't respond. I could see he didn't like someone being firm with him. Or, Dad continued, for your standard 400 in fuel, we can drop anchor at one of those fished-out public reefs like everyone else. Your choice. What's the depth, Mr. Jordan asked. 105 feet, Dad said. Mr. Jordan reached into his bag and pulled out his dive chart and studied it. 
That's 20 minutes of bottom time without decompression, he looked up. That's a hundred dollars a minute. Dad shrugged with a take-it-or-leave-it look. Mr. Jordan dropped the chart back into his bag and looked at his son. You want to do it? Shane nodded greedily. Mr. Jordan turned back to Dad. I saw his weasel brain working. I'll give you $5,000 for the coordinates. I looked at Dad. That kind of money could solve a lot of our problems. Minutes before, I would have told him to take it. But if it was really this easy to get 2000 per trip, we'd make even more than that in a week. No deal, Dad said. My only offer's on the table. Mr. Jordan stared at him, and I could imagine him using the same look to scare people in the courtroom. For the first time in a long time, I felt myself swelling with pride for Dad. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen him stand up for someone with such confidence. Fine, Mr. Jordan, finally said. We'll do it. Remind me how this works. Pay now or later? You can... You pay us now, I interrupted. Mr. Jordan looked at me. Dad smiled. That's my daughter, Julie, he said. I suppose she's the boss when it comes to the money. I could tell Mr. Jordan didn't like the idea of me getting into the middle of things. He turned to Dad again and pulled out his wallet. As he thumbed a stack of cash into the counter, I brought him a pen with a waiver form. He glanced over the paper and signed it. I picked it up with the money and counted the bills. When I saw that it was the right amount, I looked at Dad and nodded. Dad slapped his palms on the counter. All right, he said, let's get you boys out there. I thought I would have felt better holding that money, but I didn't. It all seemed too rushed and thrown together from the beginning. Julie, Shane said. What? I see a light. A light? Yeah, he said, like he'd already studied it for a while. I thought he was imagining things. I put my face against his cheek again and tried to line my eyes up with whatever it was he was looking at. It's red and flashing, he said. I didn't see anything at first. Then I picked out a soft red glow just above the horizon. I was flooded with hope as I considered that red light had to be connected to civilization in some way. Then I reasoned that no land would be this close to blue water. And a boat would have more lights and would never see us even if we could swim to it fast enough. It's probably a plane, I said. A plane would have other lights too, Shane said. I thought about that and decided he was right. Planes showed red and green and white like a boat. I kicked my fins and raised my head a few more inches above his shoulder and saw the light glow again. How far away do you think it is? Shane asked. I don't know. I said it's hard to tell. The light blinked again. If it's moving, I continued, it's not moving very fast. I can't swim that far, he said. It seems like we're moving toward it. Hold on. I let loose of Shane and got out my compass, which still glowed enough for me to read it. I got a bearing on the light and saw that it was south-southeast of us. Then I pulled out the marker and dropped it. I watched the line unspool until the end of it was yanking from my fingers, and for a moment I watched the cork trail past the jellyfish into the depths. It's too deep, I said. Too deep for what? Shane hadn't noticed that I'd lost the marker. It didn't seem to matter. He, we're probably still drifting to the southeast, so we need to alter our course to the southwest to intercept it. Shane didn't answer. We need to swim cross-current, I said. We might be able to make it. My legs are so numb, I don't think I can get them working again. We have to try, I said. I dove under and grabbed one of his legs, bent it, and straightened it. Then I did the same to the other and resurfaced. Anything, I asked? A little, he said. Suddenly, I couldn't stand the thought of us losing more valuable time. I grabbed his arm and began to kick. I think I can pull us a while, I said. Keep trying. I put on my dive mask, kept my face down, and paddled us silently along. When I wasn't catching a breath or glancing at my compass, I star stared past the jellyfish into the endless dark. I imagined moving above the corduroy ripples of the sea floor, hundreds of feet below, and that thought gave me a sense of progress. After a while, I stopped and got another compass heading on the light. It seemed like we hadn't moved at all. I felt panic begin to grip me. You've got to kick, Shane. I said, I can't do this alone. I've been trying, he said. 
You've got to try harder. We can't make it like this. I saw that Shane wasn't going to be able to get moving on his own. I got in front of him, went under, and lifted his legs until he was floating on his back. Grab them with your arms, I said. Try to pull your knees to your chest. He began to move his arms slowly toward his knees. I grabbed his hand and helped him. I watched him clutch the neoprene of his wetsuit at the knees. He tugged at it until the rubbery material popped loose. I became frustrated. I put one arm behind his neck and one behind his knee, cradling him like a baby and folding his left leg up to his chest. Now straighten it, I said. He slowly straightened the leg and a wave of hope passed through me. I swam around to his other side, did the same thing, then let him bob upright again. Try now, I said. I put my face into the water and watched his legs as he was able to slowly bend and straighten them. Afraid of losing more time, I grabbed his arm and began pulling him. Keep working them, I said. Gradually, Shane was able to start kicking enough to take away some of my burden. But the red light still appeared an impossible distance away. And I began to doubt that we'd actually make it. Current direction changes all the time. And I was basing our heading on information that was over a day old but at least trying to get us both moving again and warmed us up. After nearly an hour of steady swimming, I was exhausted. I got a final compass bearing and saw that it was now mostly southeast of us, and until we narrowed the distance some and really saw how we were drifting, there was no sense in wasting more strength. You okay, I said. My teeth are chattering again, he said, but at least I can swim a little. That thing doesn't seem any closer. I think it is, I said. It certainly isn't any further away, which is good. What if it's land? What if it's an island? I don't know how it could be, I said. There's no way, so don't get your hopes up. How can I not get my hopes up? It's probably the last chance we've got. We're dying, Julie. If that light doesn't help us, we're finished. Let's rest and save our energy, I said. We're going to have to swim some more when we get closer. You may have to start my legs again, he said. Okay, I said. I didn't want to tell him, but now my legs and arms were getting stiff too. If we were going to make it at all, we needed to make it fast. For two more hours, we paddled steadily while the red light appeared to rise every very slowly above the horizon. Gradually, I discerned a patch of darkness beneath it. We were probably a mile away when I knew what it was. An oil rig, I said. Shane didn't respond. I felt myself become overwhelmed with hope. Shane, I think it's a floating oil rig. I'll bet they have ski jackets, he mumbled. What are you talking about? And beach towels. I realized he was delirious in the advanced stages of hypothermia. I grabbed my compass and got a reading. It's a little bit more to the west, I said. We need to swim harder. Can you do it? Sure, I can do it. I'm on the cross-country team. I cradled him and tried to force his knees to his chest, but his muscles were much stiffer this time. I couldn't even get him into a sitting position. Ugh, I groaned, frustrated. I grabbed his knee and shoved it hard, but it only pushed him away from me until he came tight against the line. I watched him bob upright again. Let's call a taxi, he said. It was all I could do to stay calm. I pulled him to me again and began rubbing his legs, but his arms were stiff too and couldn't apply much pressure. Get my cell phone, he said. There are no taxis or phones, I said. You have to swim, Shane. You have to try. It's in my pocket. I started shaking and coughing. As dehydrated as I was, it was as close as my body had come to crying. I grabbed him by the straps of his BCD and shook him. We came too far for this, Shane. He stared back at me quizzically. I thought about the consequences of leaving him, and I was forced to consider something about the rig that had been bothering me. There should have been more than one red light on it. It should have been lit like an amusement park if there were people working and living on it. What if there's nobody on that ri on that thing, I said. I can't send anybody for you. It's okay, he said. No, it's not okay. I turned him on his back, grabbed his arm, and began kicking, dragging him like a log. My legs were so stiff and numb that it seemed like my fins barely moved. I didn't know if I was po if it was possible to make it, but I knew I couldn't live with myself if I left him. It rose before like an abandoned still city, 
supported nearly a hundred feet above the surface by four enormous floating columns and a crosswalk of beams connecting them. As I struggled to pull us closer, I began to hear water licking and slurping through the massive beams of its understructure. Otherwise, there was no sound coming from it at all, only the soft red glow of the hazard light from the top of the derrick. My body was about to shut down. I had to force every kick, all the while fearing I couldn't make it. We were going to pass within a hundred yards, but that hundred yards might as well have been a mile. It wasn't possible. I can't do it, Shane, I sputtered. I can't make it. But Shane wasn't answering. He hadn't said a word since I'd started dragging him. Part of me wanted to stop and check on him to see if he was still breathing, but I didn't reason that it didn't matter now, and I really didn't want to know. I stopped swimming and let go of Shane and floated there, staring at the black wall towering over us. I had never felt such helplessness. I could only watch myself drift from the last chance of ever seeing my parents again, continuing on into complete darkness. A final goodbye to my life. I felt something tap my side. I immediately thought of sharks and spun and kicked, and the faint light in the faint, faint light of the sky glow I saw a long seam in the water next to me. I reached out and touched a rope as big around as my arm. I grabbed it and felt it more heavily atop the surface. A mooring line. Shane! I shook him. Shane, I've got a rope! He muttered something I didn't understand. I began pulling myself along the rope, towing Shane behind me. Slowly, I drew us into the dark night shadow of the rig. When we were about 50 yards away, the rope began to curve up into the air to a lower platform about 20 feet overhead. I was facing a cross-current swim to make it, to the re make it the rest of the distance to the understructure, where I hoped to find something to climb onto. There was no way I could do it towing Shane with me. Listen, Shane, I said, can you hear me? He didn't answer. I'm going to have to tie you to this rope while I try to get up there. Then I'll figure out a way to get you up, okay? No answer. I untied the line from my BCD and tied it to the mooring rope. This time I doubled the strength of the line for safe measure. I'll be back, okay? Float here until I figure it out. I, quick, I kicked towards the understructure. Fortunately, there were no tall waves. In rough seas, there would be no way to approach the steel beams without getting slammed and cut to pieces in a million of and with the millions of barnacles cemented to beams clicking and snapping as the gulf swells rose and fell over them. I pulled both of our sun masks out of my BCD pocket. The swells were gentle enough that I figured if I protected my hands from the barnacles, I might be able to hold on to something. I stuck my fist inside the cloth and tucked the edges into the wrist of my wetsuit. As I drew near, the swells lifted and dropped me before a massive grid of iron and slurped and glistened into the shadows. On the next uplift, I reached out and touched the still and let my hands slide slightly down the barnacles before drifting away again. On the next approach, I moved over a few feet, rose up, and ran my hands over the still again. This time, I felt a ledge that I could hold on to. I gripped it, feeling the barnacles press sharply into my makeshift gloves. When the swell dropped, I was left hanging there, barely able to hold on. The weight was too much for my gloves, and I clenched my jaw in pain as the barnacles pressed through the cloth and cut into the soggy skin of my palms, like glass shards. Then I realized there was no way to climb with my fins on. I waited until the next swell supported me, then let go with one hand to work my fins off with the other. The barnacles cut deeper into my palm, and the pain was excruciating. I tore the fins off, let them fall into the water, then grabbed the steel with both hands again, scraping my feet around. I quickly found a foothold below me. My booties protected my feet from being cut, and I had to keep as much weight on them as I could. Once I was supporting my weight, I grabbed higher and pulled myself up with what felt like the last of my strength. And finally, I was out of the cold water for the first time in nearly 48 hours. But I was exhausted and clinging to a thin lip of steel with shredded hands and trembling knees. I couldn't hang on for long, and I was certain I didn't have the strength to do it again. 
To my left I saw, I saw a steel beam angling up toward one of the columns where it was welded to what appeared to be a low platform about four feet wide. I reached out, grabbed the beam, and fell over onto it, feeling more barnacles cut into my hands and through my legs of my wetsuit. I crawled up the beam out of the barnacle zone and under the railing. I rolled across the steel grate of the platform and I was suddenly lying on my back and free of the cruel salt water. As I lay resting, the waves rose and fell beneath me like snapping dogs. I began to study the underside of the rig and saw more of the small platforms ascending the outside of the columns and connected with ladder rungs. I wanted more than anything to lie there and rest, but I thought of Shane drifting alone and I forced myself to get up again. I left the cloth on my hands to cover what little protection it could for the deep slices on my palms. Then I started up the ladder into the bowels of this mysteriously abandoned superstructure. The underside of the rig was enormous. As I climbed higher, sky glow reflecting off the water illuminated the still and pale hues of wavering light. I must have ascended a hundred ladder steps, my footfalls echoing dull and loud under the lonely place. My hands felt sticky and oily with blood, and I told myself it was a good thing I couldn't see them, since it would only worry me more. They were going to have to work for me, no matter how they felt and what shape they were in. At the last of the platforms beneath the rig, I found myself looking down at the gulf swells a hundred feet below. Overhead was a confusing network of pipes and metal catwalks cross, crisscrossing in the faint light. One of the catwalks led to a staircase that descended to the mooring dock where Shane's rope was tied. I still didn't have any idea how I was, how I was going to get him up, but I decided to start by, off by inspecting the area and seeing what all I had to work with. I made my way over and down to the dock where I found the rope fastened to a giant cleat. I looked over the water and saw a dark lump against the rope that I assumed was Shane. The way it was drifting perpendicular to the current told me it must be tied or hung on something behind, beyond the rig. There appeared to be enough slack in it to pull Shane up to me, but even if I'd had all my strength and my hands weren't cut, the rope itself was too heavy to lift twenty feet, much less with Shane on it. Then another crushing thought came over me. What if the line tying him to the rope didn't hold? I remembered that I doubled the strength of it, but in his condition Shane wasn't going to be any help, and all of his weight would bear would rely on only two strands of that thin line. But I didn't see any other option. I had to somehow try to pull him up and hope the line held.